All right, now it's time to discuss about the most popular ones, ITTOs, the first ever one. As we discussed in the beginning, ITTO forms every single process in the PMBOK. ITTOs gets repeated. So, to make it easy, when we discuss about an input or tools and technique or output for the first time, you can see a blue color flag in the beginning of node text, just like in this picture. Since we are discussing that input, tools and technique or output for the first time, the discussion may be a little longer. We will try to cover most of the details about that particular ITTO irrespective of the context. Why we do it? Well, once you understand every detail about that input, tools and technique or output, then making relevance to the current context of discussion becomes easier. Makes sense, right? Also, whenever it gets repeated, we may have a quick recap as required. As you keep seeing and listening about it time and again, it will get stuck into your mind easily and stay longer. I know you have multiple questions now. The first and foremost, is it really required to go through the known ITTOs every time? Maybe the next question is, that's not something I see in other online courses. You are overkilling us. <laughs> Isn't it a time waste to read the same ITTO time and again? Let me answer to all three questions one by one. First, do we need to go through each and every ITTO time and again? The answer is yes, because as discussed earlier, depending on the context, the details of each ITTO varies. For example, expert judgment. It's a tool and technique that's used in many process. Depending on the context, the expert list varies. Let's say, during schedule management, the experts will be from schedule management domain. Whereas, when we discuss about risk management, the experts will be from risk management domain, obviously. The roles and responsibilities of these two experts are completely different. So, we need to walk through each and every ITTO in the PMBOK. Now, your second question. I see that in almost all the online courses, the ITTOs never get repeated or revisited. Well, to answer to that, everyone has their own style of handling PMBOK discussion. This is our project management exam guru style, of course with the reason which I explained in the previous answer. Now, the third question. Isn't it a time waste to repeat the same ITTO? The answer is not at all. As explained in the first question, each ITTO has something unique with respect to the context. So, definitely, it's not a time waster. In fact, by going through those ITTOs in relevant context, you understand why that particular input or tools and technique or output is used and how will they useful to that process. Understanding this is very, very important, not only from the exam point of view, but also from concept perspective. Let's take the omelette example. Here, let's take two key ingredients that are used to omelette making, salt and pepper. Why do we add them? Why you need them? Because pepper gives spicy taste and salt gives salty taste. By knowing it, you know the role of each ingredient and its impact on the output. In case if you don't know, then you will not have any clue on what contributes to the taste. Let's say you love spicy omelette. How to make it? Add more pepper. You add more pepper because you know what gives the spicy taste. Else, you end up in doing things by trial and error. Similarly, in the PMBOK for a process, that could be n number of inputs, tools and techniques and output. Understanding those will help to understand every single detail about the process and this understanding will help you to face the examination confidently. Not only for the exam, even when you manage your project in your organization, you know the tools that are available in the toolbox and you can select the right one that produces the exact expected result. As mentioned in the beginning, PMBOK gives you everything because it's a framework. You should know all the available ITTOs and you need to use the knowledge and skill to select the right one to achieve the desired result. So, by having a complete understanding about each ITTO and its contribution to the process will help you to answer the situation-based questions easily in the examination. I hope I answered at least some of your key questions. Let's move on. All right, now it's time to discuss about the first input, business documents. 
I hope you remember our earlier discussion in the introduction session. Business document contains two documents. One is business case and the other one is benefits management plan. Let's quickly recall them. These two documents are interdependent and iteratively developed and maintained throughout the life cycle of the project. The project sponsor is accountable for the development and maintenance of the business case, whereas the project manager is responsible for providing the recommendation and oversight to keep the business document in alignment with goals and objectives of the organization. Not just the business case, but also the benefits management plan, project charter and project management plan. So, business case, benefits management plan, project charter and project management plan are the documents should be in alignment with each other and in alignment with the goals and objectives of the organization. When do you update business documents? Business documents are not or not project documents. So, the project manager does not update or modify the business documents. Although business documents are developed prior to the project, they are reviewed periodically. Why do we do it? To ensure the project will deliver the intended result. Now let's talk about business case. Business case contains information such as what triggered to do this project, what is the benefit to the organization, high level scope, stakeholders affected, economic feasibility study and project success criteria. Now benefits management plan. The benefits management plan contains information about target benefits, alignment with the strategy of the organization, time frame to realize the benefits, benefits owners, the metrics that will indicate about benefits, assumptions and risks. Now let's talk about agreements, the next input. Let's start with the overview. Agreements represent relationship between two parties. This obligates the seller to provide the specified product, service or results and obligates the buyer to compensate the seller. Agreements have multiple names such as contracts, memorandum of understanding, service level agreements, letter of agreement, letter of intent, verbal agreement, email or other written agreements. When agreements become contract, then contracts are legally bind two parties. But remember, just agreement alone won't bind two parties. It's a contract that binds two parties. Mostly, agreements are used for internal purpose. Agreements are used to define initial intention of the project. Contracts are used when there is an external parties involved. Now, agreements in current context. Project charter is also a type of agreement. Project charter briefs what the project is going to deliver, of course, at high level. All projects should have a charter whether the project is an internal initiative or is being done for an external customer. In case of an internal project, the initial agreement may be as informal as an email or a conversation about what project will deliver. It could also take the form of memorandum of understanding or letter of agreement. When the work is being done for an outside organization, a formal contract is typically involved. Why contract is created? Why can't you manage with charter? Because, yes, you know the reason. Because project charter is not a legal document that bind two parties. So, contract is created. This means that on a project where there is a buyer and a seller, both organizations should create project charter. Very importantly, from their own point of view. The buyer's reason for the project is to achieve the project scope. Whereas the seller's reason for the project is to increase the revenue increase the reputation and or get more additional work from the buyer through the current work. The next one is enterprise environmental factors. I hope you remember our earlier discussion about enterprise environmental factors. There are two types of enterprise environmental factor. You know it. We already discussed about it. One is internal and the other one is external. Let's start with the internal. In internal, the organization culture, structure, and governance will have influence in project charter. In external, the external environmental factors such as market condition, social and cultural influences and issues, legal restrictions, commercial database, academic research, government or industry standards, financial considerations, 
physical environmental elements will have influence in develop project charter all right let's talk about organizational process assets let's start with the overview project charter briefs what the project is going to deliver at high level the opa will have influencing factors historical information and lessons learned repository example project records and documents information about results of previous project selection decision and information about previous project performance can be helpful monitoring and reporting methods organizational standard policies process and procedures portfolio program and project governance framework are some of the inputs from opa in fact the governance function and process can provide guidance to decision making and lastly the templates such as example project charter template can even be an input let's jump into the itt was first expert judgment let's start with the overview expert judgment is the expert advice input comment feedback by the experts of their own domain who can give the best advice about cooking obviously mom who can give the best advice about schedule the scheduling expert who can give the best advice about risk management the risk management expert who can give the best advice to manage projects obviously pmp certified like you so such expertise may be a person or a group with specialized education knowledge skills experience or training now expert judgment in current context we are in develop project charter so let's look at experts related to develop project charter organization strategy because any project should be linked with the strategy of the organization project charter should have this information benefits management because project charter should indicate what will be the benefit to the organization at the end of the project technical knowledge of the industry and focus area of the project so project charter should chart out technically what are the deliverables duration and budget estimation because project charter should have a high level delivery date and cost risk identification because project charter should include high level risks the next is data gathering first let's talk about the overview then we will jump into the tools in data gathering data gathering techniques are used to collect ideas information data from stakeholders subject matter experts and team members here in data gathering technique we have brainstorming focus groups and interviews let's look at them first brainstorming let's start with the overview in plain simple words it's a group discussion to call it more formally it's a group creativity technique there is a problem solution required from the team member so you call them for a meeting talk about the problem as the team member to give ideas to solve it possibly the team members can be from different work group domain or work area because you need out of the box thinking you collect the ideas you rank them you select one or multiple ideas and implement in the project brainstorming is a situation where a group of people meet to generate new ideas and solutions around a specific domain of interest by removing inhibitions but why brainstorming brainstorming combines a relaxed informal approach to problem solving with lateral thinking brainstorming provides a free and open environment that encourages everyone to participate the selves to get people unstuck in one single thought which normally happens in normal way of thinking it encourages people to come up with thoughts and ideas that can at first seems to be a bit crazy some of these ideas may be direct creative solution to your problem while others can spark even more ideas quick re ideas are welcome and built upon and all participants are encouraged to contribute fully helping them to develop a rich array of creative solutions here the major advantage is a lot of ideas get created in short span of time let's look at some of the do's and don'ts first do's choose a diverse group 6 to 10 people is idle a facilitator is must this is to ensure that the session do not get derailed from its original intention the manager is often a poor choice include some provocative outsiders to challenge the conventional thinking use different techniques to manage the brainstorming process itself and capture all the ideas as ideas are expressed they are simply recorded 
This can be done on post-it mind map or flip charts. Here, quantity is the key. Quantity leads to quality in brainstorming. So, don't stop until you have large number of ideas, typically 60 to 100 or even more. Go beyond reason. Wild ideas are useful because they challenge the boundaries and provoke other fresh ideas. Try it on other people's ideas. When one person suggests a creative concept, the other should chip in with extension and develop further. Analyze. Once ideas are popped up with enough number, then go for analyze phase. Narrow down the list to a handful of really good ideas. Now let's look at some of the don'ts. The first and foremost, suspend judgment. No one is allowed to criticize or even discuss the ideas thrown. A facilitator should lead it. I know we are getting too much into detail, so let's stop here. The next topic is brain writing. In the brainstorming session, the extroverts dominates the session. Obviously, right? Some introvert participant may have a lot of ideas, but they may not even open up. That's when the brain writing technique helps out. The participants are asked to write their idea on a piece of paper. Then every team members get an opportunity to share the ideas. Depending on the participants, the brainstorming or brain writing or both can be used as a technique to bring ideas into surface. Now in context, brainstorming can be used to gather data and solutions or ideas from stakeholders, subject matter experts and team members when developing the project charter. The next tools and technique is focus group. First, the overview. What is focus group? It's a brainstorming technique that is used to produce ideas to get feedback from stakeholders. Focus group could be of two types. First one, generate ideas. Like in brainstorming, you get people to get ideas. It could be in the form of asking questions about the stakeholders' expectations for the end product. The questions will be of specific topic. When you are selecting team members for focus group, make sure you get a diverse group. You don't want the information you collect to be skewed or represented only one point of view. That's why you select people from diverse group. The output could be ideas, feelings and reactions. The second type is to improvise ideas. This type of focus groups takes one step further from brainstorming. We can call it as more formal form of brainstorming. As like for brainstorming, there will be a facilitator. During a focus group, you are looking to gather the likely comments or feedback about an idea or solution. The participants of this meeting, preferably the potential end users, or the people who use or consume the product. The result of the focus group would be the answer or feedback about an idea that you have gathered during the meeting. This feedback can be compiled and organized by themes to present to the sponsor. For example, focus group is used after the development of a prototype in order to get an idea of how the market will respond to certain features of the solution. Now, Let's talk about focus group in develop project charter context. In develop project charter, the focus group brings together the stakeholder and subject matter experts to learn about the perceived project risk, success criteria, and other topic in a more conversational way than one-to-one -one interview. The next tools and technique is interview. As usual, let's start with overview. Interviews are used to obtain specific information from stakeholders. They can be one-to-one -one or one-to-many. They can be formal or informal. A series of questions are asked to the stakeholders to understand the perspective on a specific topic. Interviews should be conducted in an environment of trust and confidentiality to encourage honest and unbiased contribution because at times, interview can bring out confidential information as well. Now, interviews in current context. In develop project charter, interviews are used to obtain information on high-level requirements, assumptions or constraints, approval criteria and other information from stakeholders by talking to them directly. Stakeholders are asked to explain how they visualize or use the project's end product or service. By talking to the people one-to-one, -one, you get them explain what exactly they need, you can be sure about their need and your project can meet its goal. These interviews can be informal or formal, done one-to-one -one or conducted in groups. 
One drawback with this technique, as you guessed it, it's very, very time consuming. All right, the next tools and technique is interpersonal and team skills. Let's start with the overview. Interpersonal and team skills, sometimes also known as soft skills. It's a skill used to effectively lead and interact with team members and other stakeholders. Some of the interpersonal skills can be used during develop project charter or conflict management, facilitation and meeting management. Let's get into the details. Conflict management. First overview. Conflict management is all about managing the difference of opinion between the team members or between the stakeholders. It's one of the essential soft skill or interpersonal skill every project manager should have. Now, conflict management in developed project charter. Here in developed project charter, the conflict management is used to bring stakeholders into alignment on objectives, high level requirements, project description, summary milestones, success criteria, and other elements of the charter. The next interpersonal and team skill is facilitation. As usual, let's start with overview. Facilitation is the ability to effectively guide a group event to a successful decision, solution, or conclusion. Let's look at some of the roles of a facilitator. Ensures effective participation from every stakeholder. Everyone's contributions are considered. Ensure that the participants have achieved a mutual good understanding. Conclusions or results have fully buy-in according to the decision process established for the project. The actions and agreements achieved are appropriately dealt with afterwards. This facilitation skill plays a vital role when involving multiple stakeholders and when they contribute with their input to the project. The project manager should use the facilitation technique to bring all the stakeholders to the same page and get a buy-in to the charter elements. Because of their interactive group nature, well-facilitated session can build trust, foster relationship, and improve communication among the participants, which can lead to increased stakeholder consensus. In addition, issues can be discovered earlier and resolved more quickly than in individual session. Now, facilitation in current context. In developed project charter, facilitation is used to get a common understanding in terms of project objectives, high-level product and project scope, deliverables, etc in order to effectively guide a group event to a successful decision, solution, or conclusion. The next is meeting management. Let's start with the board view. Meeting management is taking steps to ensure that meetings meet their intended objectives effectively and efficiently. Let's look at some of the steps to be used for meeting planning. Prepare and distribute the agenda stating the objectives of the meetings. Ensure that the meeting starts and finish at the published time. Ensure the appropriate participants are invited and they attend the meeting. Manage expectations, issues and conflicts during the meeting. Record all actions and the people made responsible to complete those actions. Now, meeting management in developed project charter context. Invite all the relevant stakeholders and manage the meeting efficiently to develop project charter. The last tool is meetings. First, overviews. Meeting may be face-to-face, -face, virtual, formal, or informal. They may include project team members and other project stakeholders when appropriate. Now, in context, different meetings may have their own purpose. For this process, meetings are held with key stakeholders to identify the project objectives, success criteria, key deliverables, high-level requirements, summary milestones, and other summary information. All right, now let's talk about the outputs. The first one is, obviously as you guessed rightly, project charter. Because we are in developed project charter process, so project charter is the first output, obviously. First, let's discuss about the characteristics of project charter. As you know, project charter is a document. Typically, it's created by the project sponsor, Sometimes the project manager may create the project charter, but it's signed off and issued by the sponsor. This is done as a part of project initiation. Project charter formally authorizes the existence of the project. No project exists without a project charter. Project charter provides authority to the project manager to apply organization resources 
such as finance, human, etc. to project activities to deliver the project. Let's talk about the content of project charter. We already had a detailed discussion, so let's have a quick recap. The project charter will have general information about project, the project title and a description, name and authority of the sponsor or the person who authorizes the project, assigned project manager, responsibility and authority level, describes the project purpose and justification like why this project is undertaken among others. The project charter may have information not just financial or even other basis to justify the project such as legal compliance. Information as detailed as possible about scope such as what the project is going to deliver. A high level information on the project and on the product service or result the project is intended to satisfy. The key product deliverables that are wanted and what will be the end result of the project. High level stakeholders requirements. Remember, you are in initiation stage of the project, so you may not have a lot of detail at this point in time. Success criteria for each deliverables. But why each deliverable? Because the success criteria for each deliverable may vary. What is considered as success for one deliverable may not be the same for other deliverable. Overall project exit criteria, that is, what are the conditions to be met in order to close the project or on what condition to terminate or cancel the project. The exit criteria may be applied even to project phases. High level assumptions. Assumptions are something that we assume to be true without proof. Example, I thought I will get the resource on time so that I can start the project by this week. So, it's very important to document all the assumptions such as estimation of schedule, estimation of cost, how resources have been identified for the project. The assumptions are made in the project for two key important things. First and foremost, to protect you as a project manager. When estimation goes wrong, you can always refer back the assumption, meaning on what basis this is made. Let's say you assume that there will be six resources available for the project on 26th of this month. But let's say you got only three resources, so things went for a toss. The second one is assumptions create historical record, meaning they can be used in future similar projects or in the same project in the future phases. You have to remember that assumptions can become risk if they become not true or addressed on time. In the previous example, we assumed that three resources will be available on 26th. But in reality, there were only three, which put the project on risk of not delivering on time. The next one is high level constraints. Constraints are the limitations. They could be financial constraints, such as only $10,000 can be spent during project planning phase. Resource constraints. Resource constraints such as three key resources will be available only after 12th of this month. Schedule. The project charter may include schedule details such as dates for the major deliverables and their milestones. Cost. The project charter may have cost details such as pre-allocated fund. Quality. The expected quality level of the deliverable can be part of the project charter. Resources. The project charter may have information about the resources which include financial such as pre-approved financial resources, physical and human resource. Resources pre-assignment. By the way, resources pre-assignment are nothing but the resources to the project are identified at the stage itself, meaning in the initiation stage itself. For example, for turnkey projects, a highly skilled resource may be identified in the initiation stage itself and will be pre-assigned because the project is so critical to the organization. Communication. Here we are talking about project approval requirements. That is what constitutes the project success, who decides the project is successful and who signs off. Risks. Overall project risks, which are already identified, should be documented in the project charter. If the organization has done a similar project in the past, those information can be helpful to add them as high level risks. Requirement. In case of any work to be done externally by the vendor, then those information can be added right away in the project charter. List of key stakeholders can be part of project charter. In fact, even their high level requirements also can be added. 
those information should be shared with all the stakeholders. This gives a clear picture at high level about the project stakeholders. Also, this ensures a common understanding among the stakeholders on the key deliverables, milestones, and the roles and responsibilities. Signing authority. Of course, at the end of the document, the project charter will be signed by the project sponsor, which makes the project charter as an official document and authorizes you as a project manager. All right. I hope by now you got a good understanding about project charter and its elements. Now, an exercise to you. Take a piece of paper, write down the elements of a project charter for your one of the recently completed project or an ongoing project. Don't skip this exercise. This is very important for you to understand, remember and recollect the content of project charter. You need to have a good understanding about the project charter because the content of project charter at various level will be discussed throughout the PIMBOK guide. So this exercise is very, very important. Also in the sample examination, you can expect multiple twisted questions about project charter and its content. So be ready. The next one is assumption log. Let's start with the overview. What is assumption log? The assumption log is a document that records all the assumptions and constraints. Okay, what is the content of an assumption log? In assumption log, the known assumptions that are related to the product and projects are documented. How is it useful to the project? The assumption log guides technical specification, estimation, schedule, risks, etc. When is it created? Typically, the high level assumptions and constraints are part of business case. But some project manager do include initial assumptions and constraints in the project charter. In those cases, the assumption log is created in project initiation stage itself. Otherwise, the assumption log is created in the planning phase. When is it updated? Activity level assumptions are generated throughout the project. Assumption log is updated throughout the project because as the project progresses, new assumptions get uncovered. Existing assumptions are modified. Now in context, typically the high level assumptions and constraints are part of business case, but some project managers do include initial assumptions and constraints in the project charter. In those cases, the assumption log created in project initiation stage itself. All right, that wraps up ITTO. Let's move to the next process.